So, um, hello, um, everybody, and welcome um, to Siegel Talks here at the Martin e. Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY of the City University of New York in Manhattan. And uh, so, Wednesday for us is the eight weeks of uh, talks with uh, theater artists from around the world and the globe. Um, um, it, we get uh, conflicting messages. Uh, we hear that in Brazil and Latin American countries, it's a devastating uh, losses. Uh, they're coming uh, in there over a thousand yesterday. Meanwhile, in New York's state and New York City, which is the epicenter in the world, it seems uh, to be uh, that hospitals are less, um, less, uh, less full. But 1,200 prison wards are infected out of 9,000 we hear, uh, so which is quite, quite an uh, astonishing thing, symbol. And I wonder what Foucault would think about that fact. Um, we, um, we are listening today um, to um, one of the significant um, artists of the 20th uh, century, uh, artists that uh, uh, defined and was in the epicenter of what is called as the New York school of a New York scene of a the uh, performing arts, uh, we have with us uh, Richard Foreman. Um, Richard Foreman's uh, work, and I'm just gonna say a little bit maybe also for our international viewers, uh, is uh, um, reads uh, like uh, the, the history of uh, New York avant-garde experimental theater in itself. He was influenced and friends <clears throat> of the living theater, Jonas Mackes, uh, Robert Wilson, the great Jack Smith. Uh, he was a collaborator of Richard Schachner, and um, <clears throat> together they once founded the 68 Collective. And if you just look at the, the, the groups that were participating was the Mabu Mines, Marinus Monk Performance Group, Richard's Group that later on morphed into the Wooster Group, the Ridiculous Theater Company. And then of course his own uh, creation, the Ontological Hysterical um, Theater in St. Mark's Church, which is for everybody as a kind of a sacred uh, place. You have been there, you had to see the work uh, like every spring, it was like clockwork and you know that it would be a good year uh, in the theater once you saw Richard uh, Foreman production. Uh, generations of New York theater makers also have gone through it and I'm just gonna see they, a few home, David Hershkowitz from the Target Theater, Radio Hall, Elevator Repair Service, very early John Jessrom, the Nature Theater of Oklahoma, Pavel Liska, NTUSA, Yehuda, Richard Maxwell, Young Jean Lee, um, Nick uh, Benarsev from the Assembly, and many, 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 many others uh, went through his work. Um, his work is- um, Well, I should, uh, what I mean, what you should yeah. mean is that those people you named were all uh, interns at my theater at one point. All interns, they all got their start. They were influenced. Yes. Uh, it was a little alchemistic a kitchen, a laboratory um, with work, Gnostic work, uh, work that was uh, Kabbalistic in a way and, uh, and that uh, defied meaning, uh, that was uh, creating new forms, uh, you know, perhaps closer to a French uh, theory at the time, where he also went very often to Paris and the Festival d'Autonne, but he also did work at the Lincoln Center at the public. Anyway, so Richard's work, um, for those who knows, um, has been a, a, a signpost, a very, very, very strong one. And uh, before Hans Thies Lehmann wrote his uh, book on the post-traumatic theater 30, 40 years earlier, he was practicing um, that and anticipated a future. So um, it's a great uh, honor to have Richard with us here today. He is no longer presenting. Performance uh, work is still involved in it. And, creating video and film work. Um, so uh, enough of me now, uh, but we talked to theater artists here on Siegel Talks to hear how they experience this time of Corona, how they think about how they create and give meaning or take meaning away. And um, to hear from Richard, from whom we now do not hear uh, enough is a, a very uh, significant uh, a conversation for us. So Richard, I'm sorry about my long wordy introduction and words of course cannot uh, ever uh, capture your work and your, your vision, your ideas. So first of all, welcome. Well, I'm glad to be here. Um, you have to uh, start me by asking whatever you want to ask. Uh, when I made theater, I did not have this beard. Uh -huh. say that. Uh, so is this beard from Corona time? No, it really started before but maybe I anticipated it because I anticipated a lot of things in my life. So where are you right now? 
Well, you know, for the last few years, I've had difficulty walking and I haven't really left my loft. I mean, I live in a big loft in Manhattan and uh, I gotta say, shockingly, that nothing seems that different to me in my personal life because we've always called for food from outside. Uh, you know, what can I say? Video is omnipresent. So nothing in that sense is that changed for me. Now, of course, the uh, plague seeps under the door like fog, like mist, comes through the closed windows. So I'm certainly aware of it. But uh, how does my work reflect that awareness? I hope not very much, because I think that uh, most people who try to attack a problem like that directly end up making a kind of journalistic theater, you know, which is fine. Everybody should prosper. But I have no interest in that. I've always been making, interested in making a kind of poetic theater, you know, I guess you would say, in which I'm making objects that are like solid, beautiful diamonds that you cannot penetrate, but the different uh, facets of the cut diamond reflect things in the world uh, that everybody can see and relate to. I, I believe that uh, if I was making theater, I would continue to try to make things that were, in fact, on a certain level, impenetrable. Uh, you mentioned uh, Michel Foucault in your introduction. Foucault saw one of my plays and said the best thing that had ever been said about my plays. Foucault said, you know, it was fascinating. I could tell there was some kind of rigorous system at work, but I couldn't figure out what that system was. Uh, I'd like everybody to feel that way. I'd like everybody to be fascinated to sense that indeed there was some controlling intelligence, but they shouldn't be able to psych it, psych it out. It should be an eternal mystery. Like I think everything in life should be, that is interesting should be thought of as an eternal mystery. And the code cannot be cracked. Uh, I shouldn't be in the theater, therefore, because the theater, of course, is based on the idea, usually, that, well, there's the audience, and there has to be communication to the audience, and the feedback from the audience. And I've never bought into that. Uh, so I've said from the very beginning that I was a misfit in the theater, in a way. Um, and I think that was my value. Uh, a good friend of mine, Howard Bloom, who's written some wonderful books about the world, described what I was doing. He said, Richard, you make uh, diverse, you, diversity generators. You turn out diversity generators. And I think that's quite accurate. So um, that's where I was and that's where I am today. <clears throat> now in making film, I'm not sure. Film is more of a mystery to me still. And I'm not sure exactly what I'm trying to do when I make films. I can see that it's easier to penetrate than was my, was my theater. Um, because you, well, film just sort of engulfs you in a way that my theater did not. My theater was in essence behind a wall of glass. And we even put up glass sometimes at the front of the stage. And nevertheless, I wanted to say to the spectator, hold it, hold it, don't come in. But I would build the set and items of the set around the audience. So that at the same time I was saying, hold it, don't come in. I was trying to include people in that world uh, for which the key perhaps was not provided. Yeah. And that's what I would do now. I made a few forays into doing plays. Oh, when George Bush was president, uh, we did a play 
called King Cowboy Rufus Rules the Universe. And it was about this sort of cowboy figure with his six guns, obviously was a stand in for George Bush and what I did not like about George Bush in those days. But uh, even that, the genesis of that was not the desire, not, not saying, how can I say something about George Bush and the world? I always worked by taking my notebooks, which had all kinds of stuff that just came out of me, looking for pages that I thought I could put together. And then after that was put together, and after it was staged, sort of seeing a theme emerge and circling around that theme, but never, never starting out saying, I want to do a play about this, or I want to do a play about that. To me, that's never been interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Perhaps not. You had, no, you, so you had, and Pavel Liska mentioned that when he was on Siegel Talks, he referred to you and said you were the one who already put a glass screen uh, between the audience. Yeah, it's funny, you know, because I did it, one, one of the plays, the first play I did in Paris, uh, you know, they'd never seen anything like that, and a lot of the audience walked out and so forth. And it was in Jean-Louis Barrault's theater. And Jean-Louis Barrault, when I was young, had been a hero of mine. So uh, at the end, uh, there was a party, and Jean-Louis Barrault came up and said, ah, oh, Richard, huh? your theater was very fascinating, but I tell you something. You cannot do theater behind a wall of glass. And of course he meant my style, my stay away style. Mm -hmm. uh, and ironic that in later years, I did do theater behind a wall of glass. Yeah. And you know, which now is perhaps one of the things people think about to create performances where perhaps actors are behind masks or behind uh, plexiglass, like in shops uh, where we go to, um, I'm sure even so, you say you're secluded, uh, perhaps monkish, uh, perhaps uh, rabbinical uh, existence, which you have now, where yeah. you study the holy texts and images. Um, but COVID must be on your mind, the virus. What do you think? About it? Uh, I think it's terrible that people are dying. I think one has to bear in mind that it's still a tiny percentage of people that get sick and that die. And that doesn't make it any less awful that that's happening. But I, I think that can't be the focus. I mean, life goes on and uh, the intelligence should go on. So I, I'm not interested in seeing, I've never been interested in seeing plays that are about the current situation. The current situation always takes care of itself and presents it to people in various ways. The task of an intelligent person, an intelligent viewer, is somehow to separate oneself from those circumstances. I don't think those circumstances teach very much. I don't think it teaches very much that people are dying from this plague. Yes, of course, it's terrible. And I, I, I want there to be a cure like anyone else. But the fact of death being more present than it normally is, well, it, it doesn't really teach me anything. Uh, I'm going to die soon just because, you know, I'm 83. And how much longer will I live? Probably not that much longer. But uh, it's really not part of my agenda, or is it? Or has it always been? Um, maybe, but not more now. I refuse to have it be more now than it was throughout my whole creative life. Now that may shock people, but uh, I don't mind. I've always been in the business of trying to shock people. Uh, because I think that's what people need. People don't need a chorus of people saying, oh, this is the situation, yes, woe is me, what can we do about that? I don't think that's needed. I think shocks are needed. And I never did shocks by uh, very aggressive things like having people uh, 
make love to each other on stage and so forth. I made shocks that again, didn't often perceive as such, but I think it was shocking to your system. One of the shocking things I did along with the glass walls that really made a lot of people uptight, I always had a lot of lights focused on the audience, which sort of blinded the audience. And I thought a kind of blindness forces you back into dealing with the seeing problem of seeing the play on stage, in spite of the fact that, wow, those lights are brightly shining on me. So it forced perception to operate slightly differently. Kind of shock. That was a kind of shock. Yeah. Yeah, it really, really was. I think one of the great contributions um, of, of your theater is that it reinforced these new ideas, I think, of, of, of uh, that late modernity or the post-modern modernity, post-traumatic modernity, that one become, becomes conscious of the process of interpretation and of seeing. That it's not, you see this and that, emotions are manipulated, things are explained, that you, you tried at least, I think, to see, they become conscious of what you see and uh, and understand it's one one way of looking um, at the world. Absolutely, absolutely, that always concerned me. One of the first things I did was an opera uh, called Elephant Steps. And uh, at one point, who was it? Uh, Julius Rudell, who ran the uh, New York City Opera at that point. He asked me what effect I wanted to have on the audience. And I said, well, Mr. Rodell, uh, the greatest compliment that I had was from somebody who saw the production that was, I think it was at Hunter College, I forget where. And she said, you know, Richard, I really enjoyed watching your opera, but more than I enjoyed that, I enjoyed watching myself watch it. And Julius Rodell lost interest in me at that point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I thought that was a great compliment. No, 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 it's, it's a really, really significant uh, a contribution in a way of Roland Barthes' idea that not the writing, what you read is of significance, the reader, the interpretation, the connections you make of the multiplicity of text, the intertextuality, and that you focused on the mind of the audience uh, and not the mind in that sense of the director that you say, I have to take meaning away. Instead of explaining the inexplainable, you said, let's make what's uh, explainable unexplainable um, and- I would make I, one correction. Yeah. In my case. Yes. Not what's in the mind of the audience, mm -hmm. but what's in the mind of each individual spectator. Each individual, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a radical uh, invention, uh, a significant one that uh, radiated, as you said, uh, like a diamond and diamonds are diamonds because more light comes out than comes in, that's why. They are brilliant, that's why uh, they are shining. Richard, if you would be still in the business, as you say, to make your show um, <laughs> now, is there something from the time that would touch you to say, I might go this, even if it's not connected? Is that, do you have something, some scenarios in your mind, what you would do if you would had to open next month? You know, I thought about that when I knew I was gonna have to give this talk. And I have to say no. For me, it's like an iron curtain has come down <laughs> in front of the theater. And I, I can't imagine what I would do. I suppose what I would have to do would be, I don't think I'd want to proceed from the text anymore. The text was always the most important element to me. I always started with a text, always. But I suppose I would like to get five or six people in a room and uh, just say to them, look, uh, I have to make another play. Uh, and maybe you could be in it. But I just want to look at you. I just want to watch you for a while. And they would say, hmm, you want us to invent little scenes? I said, no, 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 no. I just want to watch you. I mean, do whatever you want to do. 
and I would watch and try to see some little something that clicked in my mind that I would think maybe I could build upon. Like right now, I'm watching you and I don't, I, I don't know if how well the people can see you, but you are sitting there nodding your head slightly. Well, that might be something. You know, maybe I could build upon that. I don't know. Okay, so the, the idea in a, in, in a very small group and observing and sharing a moment I don't know. You know, I always shy away from those normal friendly terms like sharing. Mm -hmm. I think it's more like setting up a little, not explosion. I'm not interested in explosions. But again, I would return to the image of a diamond that doesn't let you see into it, but it refracts beams of light that might be fascinating. I'm interested in fascinating, I suppose, not in sharing. Hmm. Now, one might say, well, but in this time of crises, that's, that's cold, that's inhuman. I don't think it is. Uh, I don't think I cut off the human part of me, as I say. You know, it's, the, it's doctors and scientists' job to figure out a cure and to take care of people who are ill. I don't think it's the artist's job to do things that would soothe those people or distract them. What is the artist's job, what do you think, in this time we live? I think, the art of, I think at all times, the artist's job is to make something that is both mysterious, which means impenetrable. That's another word for impenetrable. Mysterious, yet fascinating. So you are drawn into an involvement with that which is fascinating, but you cannot explain. I really think that is the artist's job. Now, you may say, well, but that's not what Shakespeare did. <laughs> uh, no, probably not. But uh, that's not my problem. I can only see it from the perspective of what 20th century artists are trying to do with the 20th century world. I'm sorry, we're in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. See, I'm, in, I'm living in the past, but it's okay. Hmm. Are you, even so you say your time now doesn't differ so much the pre-corona time you are, I think in Wooster Street in your loft uh, in New York, um, do you engage daily in making art now? Well, yes, because I'm making film, which mostly means editing footage that I shoot very fast. Yes, so I'm making art every day. So tell us a little bit, how does your day look like and what do you do in that editing? Well, you know, when I, I've shot video very fast. I generally shoot in four days, I get enough material. You have a couple of actors together in one yeah. building or one room? Yes. Yes, like the material that I'm working on now, uh, it was some of my people, but also people from Slovenia. Because um, years ago, I was supposed to go to Slovenia and work with some actors, but I got sick and I couldn't fly or something. So they said, well, can you do it on Skype? So I was looking at Skype and trying to direct the actors. I felt it was kind of silly, but I did it. But then the actors said, oh, no, we liked it. It was interesting. And we'd like to come to New York and really do a project with you. Well, I didn't think that they were serious. But like four years later, I got a telephone call and they said, well, we're all set. We're coming to New York. OK. So uh, I told the woman who was organizing it that we should get a, an Airbnb space. And she found this incredible brownstone in West Harlem, up in like 139th or something. And it was full of antiques, and it was beautiful. And uh, we had that four story space for a week. And 
I told the act, I gave the actors tasks that were not unlike the tasks I used to give them in my plays. It would be abstract things like, okay, now, uh, Max, you go over to the table, put your hands on it, then think, oh no, my head hurts, hold your head and slowly collapse. Okay. Uh, but all kinds of things like that, simple things. And we did that and I got material and then came home, took all of that material and I've been editing it now for a year and a half. Uh, it's all on the editing. So because, four days of shooting, a year and a half of editing. Yes, yes. Uh, it's all in the editing. Because the mysteries you're looking for, it, you, you discover them between, yes. between the images? Uh, no, because in uh, Final Cut online, I work in Final Cut Pro still, even though it's supposed to be outdated now, mm -hmm. uh, you can do everything to the image. You can make a different kind of light, different kind of texture, zoom in, do different things. And it's figuring out how to distort the image. Uh, a lot of times, like if you make it very bright, just like I used to shine lights in the audience's eyes. So it was bright, but you couldn't really see the actors. I mean, you could, but it was hard. So working in Final Cut, you can make the image sort of washed out and bright. Uh, and you can do all kinds of things like that. And it's doing that that engages me that I do for three or four hours every day. So my day consists now of getting up at breakfast with my wife and then uh, and looking at the, the New York Times online, looking to see what's happening in the world, mm -hmm. uh, looking up what Trump is doing, <laughs> mm -hmm. and then going to work on my film. And then I have lunch and then I, I rest a little bit. And then in the evening, uh, my wife and I watch a film. That's my life. And that's satisfactory to me. Sounds like At 83, I don't have the energy to do much more. It sounds like a beautiful uh, day to me. If you uh, mention Trump, uh, what do you think about contemporary America? Well, I've never been shy about saying in print, everywhere else, that I've always had a very ambivalent attitude towards America. There are many things about America I do not like. I do not like the businessman culture that rules America. Uh, and so Trump is just a radicalization to an absurd degree of that. Uh, when I worked in Paris, my dream was to go live forever in Paris. And I almost did that, but at the last minute it became difficult. But I was, it was lucky, I think, because I realized I would never really be a Frenchman. And the battles that I had to fight, making art being a battle at all times, the battles that I, a sort of awkward American, had to fight were here in America. So I had to stay here and deal with all of the things I hated about America, because that's who I was, an American. The battle of producing in America or the battle of the artist in the world? The battle of the artist trying to mold material that he got from his placement in America. You know, uh, because Americans talk in a certain way. Americans move in a certain way. That's why I always told my, I, my actors on stage, I was not satisfied with the way the American language sounded when spoken by normal actors. So I had two techniques. I would tell the actors, try to put your voice low in your register. So you're always talking like that. Uh, that sort of flattened out the voice and made it more interesting to me. Uh, or I would give the actors an accent. I would say, okay, look, use some kind of phony German accent. Because that in the same way distanced the actor from what they were saying and made the words emerge as these clunky things that had a 
a tactile interest. So those are two of the ways in which I would battle uh, my material, which was my actors. Mm -hmm. If you say it was a, a you wanted Prince, to be- By the way, mm -hmm. by the way you, you have an accent. You're from yes. where? Germany. 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 German accent. Yeah, I think Brecht always uh, liked uh, actors uh, <clears throat> who had an accent and Heiner Müller always would point out that he believed that uh, actors, you know, are more credible if they had an accent, they were not representing the official oh, state yeah. language yeah. or yeah. Uh, were, would wear words, as he said, like uh, Gucci clothes. No, I, that's, that was my theory yeah. very early on. Huh? Yeah. So do, if you said in that battle uh, to, to make art in America, which is one of the hardest thing, and I don't know if people really realize, especially in the European world, how hard it is. And so do you see it as a, a contribution to society in a political uh, sense uh, the, that the artists work? Um, yes, in this sense. I don't see it in the political sense that it would be good to take a Marxist point of view, which I might agree with, and you know, make a play with that being very present, as would be the case in Brecht. But I think Americans, the reactionary nature that's built into all Americans comes from uh, wanting to know where they are. Uh, you know, they asked you, used to ask you years ago, are you a commie? Are you a good American? What are you? And Americans wanted to know where they were placed and wanted to feel secure. Uh, because American culture was such a vast thing. So I thought that in order to fight the American mindset, uh, I had to do things that, as I've described, were hard to penetrate and make, made people not able to easily relate to them with their normal personality, which was always a reactionary personality, even if you were a liberal in America. Basically, your mindset was somehow reactionary. And the way to do that was through the style of the work, I thought, not through the content. What did you find that was that worked? I mean, I think also theater makers now are looking for, you know, have to discover new forms as you did on your own, but from your experience and from your decades of work, what do you think one should keep in mind? What is, what is something that helps to penetrate that mindset in a way? Uh, the only thing that one can say to artists, the most important thing is courage. Courage to notice where your slight ticks might take you. In other words, when I was at the Yale Drama School, the playwriting teacher was a man by the name of John Gassner was a wonderful, wonderful, wise man. And he said to me once, Richard, you know, what you do is very interesting, but you have one fault. You get something that you like in your plays and then you don't want to let go of it, but you want to repeat it. You want to repeat it. You want to repeat it. And I went home and I thought, boy, Mr. Gassner knows and uh, I must figure out a way not to, to get rid of that tendency to repetition. But then I thought, well, if that's where my instinct takes me, then my task is to radicalize that. And that's what I did. I started in the very beginning, I was making plays that just repeated a few words and a few, few basic movements. And I would repeat and repeat and repeat. And um, so I think what you have to tell people is have the courage to notice what your, what your impulse or what the ticks in your approach to things are and find a way to radicalize that because that's who you really are. Mm -hmm. Have the courage to do that. And, to, and in a way you do the opposite of what you were instructed. Yes, of course, of course. Because you can only be instructed in what's been done. <laughs> you don't wanna do what's been done. What's the point? So you have to have the courage to do what hasn't been done in spite of the fact that people will not understand, at least at first. What are your earliest memories of theater? What is the very first thing you remember that you saw where that was a kind of a theater? Uh, when I was very young, 
I think I was still in grade school, the Doily Card Opera Company, which was the English opera company that did originally Gilbert and Sullivan operettas when they were alive and is still doing them to this day. And they came to New York doing a repertoire of like eight or nine operettas. And my parents took me to see it. And that had a profound effect upon me. But the memory that I'll always have was the strongest memory. It was done in the old St. Uh, Ziegfeld Theater, which no longer exists. It was a beautiful old theater and had a curtain, a show curtain in front that was an embroidered curtain. And for some reason, I always remember when the overture started, the lights came up on the curtain and you saw these unicorns and whatever was in the embroidered curtain. And that sense of tense anticipation was my strong first impression of the theater. And that's sort of what I always wanted to get in the future, that tense anticipation of what's going to happen. What does it mean? What's it going to be? And yeah. then I saw other things, of course, but I went to the theater when I was a kid all the time. I, every Saturday, I would come in from grammar school with my friend and we would see a show. And every Broadway show that I saw, I would walk out, say to my friend, John, it's hopeless. If that's what they want, I can't be in a theater. I hate all that stuff. Uh, and then occasionally I would see something that got to me. For instance, I was very impressed with what was a big flop. Uh, Ruth Gordon, an actress who was a friend of Faulkner's, doing Faulkner's Requiem for a Nun on Broadway. And I was profoundly moved by that. It was a big flop, <laughs> but I thought that was great. Yeah. I also remember the original production that Kazan did of Kimina Real by Tennessee Williams. I thought when I was 13 years old, I thought it was wonderful. In later years, I saw an interview with Kazan where he said, well, I, I, did, I missed the boat with Kimina Real because it was a very poetic text and I should have done it in poetic fashion, but I did it as if it was very realistic. Oh my God, that's what made it great, Mr. Kazan. <laughs> poetic uh, interpretations that I saw in later years were terrible. Yeah, I mean, this, the, 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 the tension was the curtain. I, I think from your manifesto of the ontological historical theater, you said you stage uh, static tensions of interpersonal relations um, yeah, yeah. in space, you know, and- Yes, yes, yes. And, um, and, then, and then the objects um, in it. Um, would you advise or think uh, to theater artists engage in film work, in video work, in Zoom, online work? What's your take on it? That's not for me to say. You know, I started making films only when I gave up theater. And when I was a young man, I went to theater all the time and I never saw movies. You know, my friends would go to a film on Saturday afternoon and I thought, oh, no, that's that's not high class, I'm going to the high class theater. Uh, in later years, I discovered how wrong I was and I became an aficionado of film, but that was only much, much later, sort of after I'd stopped making theater, maybe a little before. But uh, then in film, I saw everything, everything. And also underground film because my friends uh, early on were the so-called underground filmmakers who gathered around Jonas Mikas. And uh, to me, that was a big revelation when I saw young people my age take little home movie cameras and make films, some of which I thought were incredibly beautiful. So, um, yeah, I, I was a child of underground films in that way. And Things like Simon Creatures. I mean, creatures, yeah. I think you were there when the police interrupted it. And... No, I wasn't there actually. Are you well, I, did, I did go to see Flaming Creatures like 13 times in a row. I thought it was so transcendental. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, yes. Jonas Mikos and another friend of mine, Ken Jacobs, were arrested. I didn't know either of them in those days. That's how I got to know them because there was an article in the paper that they got arrested. And we had been going to the film screenings, but we called up. Jonas Mikas and said, is there anything we can do to help? 
he said, oh, you can come down to the office and help file things and so forth. And I didn't do that, but my wife did. But that was my contact with all those people. So the police um, brought you together. Do you watch any online um, theater work now, new production things or, or archival work? Do you, do you engage right now in the time of Corona? Do you watch? No, <laughs> I find it hard to watch theater in any form, but theater form. I mean, all of my plays are recorded, and were put on tape and I hate it all because to me, theater is, in spite of the fact that I said, no, it's behind a wall of glass or at least a postulated wall of glass. Theater depended upon the flesh and blood presence of sweating people. And to see that on video, I think, deadens it completely. Uh, you know, there's no more tension. There's no more live bodies. So I can't watch performances uh, really on video, on video or online. Is that evil of me? <laughs> no, I think this is a, it's a significant, uh, you know, it's a significant uh, um, a comment, you know, I mean, there might, there, I, we do hear reports of young students who say, oh, really great. I don't need to go to the theater. I can just watch at home. Of course. And, on the Zoom, the and then I don't have to get out. It costs less and then I no. can study theater like this. And it's not what you miss, what you miss, even mm -hmm. in Zoom, if you're in the theater, the, uh, the stage is wide and your eyes can turn to see that side of the stage, this side of the stage and follow an actor, even though I claim that I tried to make theater where you watch the whole stage at one time. But that's not the way most theater works. I'm sure it's not the way most theater on Zoom today works, but you do not have the ability to turn your head and watch things as they cross your field of vision. Yeah. And I think uh, uh, theater for the foreseeable future, if it will be open, and it will be in a way like your theater, like uh, small spaces, um, with so smaller audiences, everything that yes. people kind of complained about, and um, and it will be now in the at the forefront. And I think your work has shown what is possible, what is thinkable, that it unlocks the mysteries we don't understand and points that actually life is a mystery and as you say, a, the dazzling one, a beautiful shining one, if one can, can see. Um, yeah, occasionally I had to do my plays on, you know, on tour and they would mm -hmm. put us in some huge opera house or something. And it was mm -hmm. absolutely absurd. I mean, you know, I tr always tried to mitigate it by, you know, I had a lot of strings across my stage that come out into the audience. So I would put strings way out into the opera house often dotted with black paint to try to make uh, that distance sort of disappear. That uh, was always a real problem. Yeah, yeah. And there often is so much urge to have huge spaces to fill it. Theater universities build gigantic uh, yeah. halls with a thousand seat or two thousand seat. And I think it's against, you know, what we have learned from, from great masters or of uh, theater, of thinkers well, like you, Peter Brook, uh, Kotowski, and others, that it's this small space yes. that is powerful. In our talks around the world, whether we speak to people now from Indonesia or from uh, Guillermo Calderon in Chile and others who say, we will go and work in small small spaces. And, yes. uh, and that is what worked. This is also in an Indian uh, colleague, uh, Abhishek, who said, uh, we, that's what we do. We have no PR. We have no money to do shows, but we do them in small spaces and the government censors them. If any, uh, you want to know if theater has an impact, ask our government. They don't censor the films, even if they are more critical themes yeah. than our stuff. Nobody wants us to, 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 to show it up. Do you feel um, that theater artists right now also should engage in kind of a social context and work to help out do soup kitchens to uh, to do you know uh, help the healthcare workers uh, do you feel well i think it's I, time I, to stop producing art or is it a time to ex de go deeper into it's a time to go deeper research. into but my answers have already indicated that i don't think there's any way to reach out 
to all those people who face danger every day and help the people who are sick or, you know, make food, deliver food. You know, my hat's off to them. And I don't see how art can contribute to them, not real art. Maybe you can make things, you know, feel good. I suppose you could make something the equivalent of mm -hmm. hair where all the all of a sudden all the the hospital workers break into song or something and it makes the people feel better but that's to me that's not real art what do you read what do you how do you engage your mind yesterday or the day before from indonesia the colleagues said we have to keep our engines warm she said, what do you do well i i look at a lot of film but mm -hmm. uh, i read for months but now it's worn out. I've been reading and rereading this French author, Modiano, who won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago. So I've been reading him. Why? Uh, why? Mm. I just found him completely seductive. He talk, because I, You know why? For bad reasons. Uh, he made me think I was in Paris again. He made me think I was walking the streets of the lesser known districts of Paris, sitting in cafes, in the lesser known places of Paris. And just in a very romantic sense, I enjoyed escaping that way. Uh, in the last two days, I've been thinking maybe I should start reading some Gertrude Stein again. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have pulled out some of her books. Tell us a bit about her. You have been often called a, a, a Steinian, a grandchild or a yeah. collaborator or whatever. What do you think of her? What does she have to tell us at the moment? You know, this is a difficult question for me. I always said that my two main teachers were Brecht and Gertrude Stein. Now it's been so long since I read Gertrude Stein that off the top of my head, it's sort of difficult for me to answer. But I know that again, to me, Gertrude Stein with that repetition, nevertheless, also held up her hand and said, don't come too close. And she, uh, I especially liked her theoretical work where she talked about, you know, what are masterpieces? And there was no clear cut answer. It was an answer that she, if you delved into it, you sort of discovered an orientation, what masterpieces were. But both she and Brecht had a kind of alienating effect. Um, and I don't think I've ever seen a successful Brecht production. I've never mm -hmm. seen the Berliner Ensemble. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I would think of one of those productions. But the productions I've seen in America were all too user friendly. Ah, with one exception, one exception. Way back when I was very young, I saw Eric Bentley, who had been in Berlin, studied with Brecht, and became an important American critic. He did. A yeah, he did a production of The Good Woman of Setswan with Uta Hagen. And I saw that and I thought that was very good. It was very cold. It was very standoffish and it was hated. <laughs> it didn't last very long. But I thought that perhaps that was the most successful Brecht I had seen. I've never seen any good Gertrude Stein. They always try to make her friendly in various ways. Uh, no, mm. it doesn't work. Mm. Um, we, we are having a few questions we're getting from, from our audience. Um, uh, Robert Stanford um, uh, wrote and said um, about musicals. You say you also did musicals and plays. They're such different uh, uh, formats. What were your, um, your, your, your favorite ones? And in the big question, are musicals a way at all to deal with the times we, we live in? And, uh, uh, perhaps, perhaps. You know, when I did musicals, I was much more of a normal theater kind of person. Uh, I did not try to make things that would keep the audience behind a wall of glass. So... Um, you did the Three Penny Opera, right? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, and I did that in a way that uh, Lada Lenya didn't like at all, because I did it in Lincoln Center which I thought was this big white elephant, you know, big white building that looked mm -hmm. sort of like a Pentagon, looked like a war machine. And I 
trying to make the, uh, my version of Three Penny Opera reflect that big, overblown Pentagon feeling. Now, which is the exact opposite of what Brecht did yeah. in his little theater in Berlin originally. Where's a Baroque theater, you know, with yeah. like all yeah. the gold yeah. and plaster, yeah. the opposite of a technical room yeah. for the... So a lot of Lenya didn't like that, but I thought I was being very true to Brecht's alienation sense. Yeah, in a way, people do bring it up. There's this idea of the social distancing and the distancing and the Brecht's idea of a theater that, you know, um, do you see any um, new connection that could be drawn? Any new connection? From that idea of that social distancing, you know, that right now we will not be able to, to be close, you know. No, I would just, feet. well, but I, what I tried to do in my work was radicalize that social distancing <laughs> without any virus, just, you know, behind a wall of glass, or stay away, don't get too close. I don't want a theater that embraces you. When I went to the Broadway theaters when I was a teenager and I hated everything, I gave one example of what I didn't hate. To me, the whole content of those performances was the actors in one way or another, even if they were playing a drama, the actors were saying, love me, love me. The director was saying, love this piece, come get closer. We invite you into this piece. I hated that. I hated that. Now, maybe that's my personality. I, I don't know, you know, but um, voila, there you are. Mm -hmm. So I think that, uh, sure, Recht would be useful if people made the proper use of him today. Mm -hmm. What, what, what do you think of, uh, I don't know when the last show, what was the last show you went to see? What do you think of contemporary, also the avant-garde or the experimental theater in New York? Oh, I don't know what the last thing I saw was. I mean, as I said, many of the people who are now well known in the exper experimental theater, I'd say at least 75% of them started in my theater as interns yes. and did their first plays in my theater. Yeah. Uh, trying to remember what the last thing I saw. Yeah. Any university in America or in the world would be proud to have the track records of interns or students you produced as someone ah, yeah. who said, I have yeah. nothing to teach to you and uh, you're on your own, you know, which yeah. is the opposite of traditional uh, uh, teaching because we in America don't have really a university that's dedicated to a truly experimental uh, a theater. Yeah, we, and open we have theater. one, we have one. Which one? Uh, Travis Preston at Cal Arts. Cal Arts, okay, that's fair. Yeah, I think Cal Arts does adventurous things and is open to doing adventurous things, and I think Travis is trying to encourage that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, he has been at the Seagull. That is that is true, and it is not looking, you know, towards Broadway and uh, yeah. towards uh, the production. I think that's what's so wrong with ART. I think Robert Brustein said that, uh, you know any money uh, that's been made in any connection with, with Broadway should go directly uh, to, to the program or to students who were, for a long time, even the acting students were forced to pay I have tuitions a, of 60, yeah. 70,000. So it's a, a shocking uh, um, a way of, uh, of educating. And uh, yes, it's happened in small spaces like yours that, you know, the Richard Maxwell's young Gene Lee, the, Pavel Liskas, the radio hall ad that came out. It's a, an incredible uh, uh, legacy yeah. you, uh, you pulled out. Yeah. There's and better uh, they do things that I don't appreciate. Well, I know the last interesting thing I've seen. Mm -hmm. uh, when I saw the original production of a group called Object Collection. Yeah. It's a group, uh, the person who does the sound used to be my sound man. He's a composer. Mm -hmm. Of very mm -hmm. aggressive music and his wife teaches costumes at Columbia but mm -hmm. she does the texts and the staging and when I first saw their first production I thought I don't know if I hate this or I love this <laughs> best possible response and I saw it again and I got to love it and uh, I think what they do is very very interesting uh, that first production they were saying this abstract text, but perhaps because she was a costume designer, all through the production, there were piles of costumes all around the stage. And the actors all the time 
We're getting into one costume, getting out of it, getting into another costume. It was great. They don't do that anymore. <laughs> but uh, I think their work is very interesting. Yeah, yeah. It, it, um, it really, uh, really is. Here's a, <clears throat> a question from, uh, from London, Patrick Kennedy, who said, you know, he had a, he directed some of your work in the UK. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I've he wants to know, when is the film coming out you're working on? How can people access them? Oh, no, I don't know. I don't care. I don't know. You I'll don't put care. it on Vimeo. I, I suppose I'll put it on I have one other film on Vimeo called Mad Love, which is not the Peter Laurie film. And it's not the Andre Breton book, mm -hmm. but it's my film Mad Love. And this new film I'll put on Vimeo also. Mm -hmm. So they can find it on your website, or in general, they just go on Vimeo and put yeah, it. Yeah, just go on Richard Vimeo. Foreman. Just go yeah. on Vimeo. Yeah, you said, probably. I don't care uh, when it's out or not. So for you, is that could be for years your editing process and uh, yeah. yeah, forced yeah. interruption to that you have to bring something? I suppose, I suppose, yes. Yes. To an end. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there are examples. There are a few examples of artists who never sort of released their work. Off the top of my head, I can't think which ones, but there were some. Mm -hmm. um, and since you say, you know, inspired, you watch film and maybe also for our, you know, listeners who now also watch uh, their at home on Criterion or other places. What, what do you watch? What do you feel is meaningful? Oh, we watch everything. And especially these days, my wife doesn't like the more challenging films that I like. Which so ones do you like? What are the more challenging I'm films? Trying to think. Uh, I used to be very fond of uh, this French filmmaker, Bruno Dumont. Um, you know, I always respected Godard, but I was not really convinced that that many of his films were that successful. And he seems to share the same opinion, actually. Mm -hmm. You can believe what he says. Uh, I, I'm sure there's somebody after Bruno de Mal, but that's the last person I can think of. Mm -hmm. He made and very, very interesting films, especially his early films, his first mm -hmm. five films. First five films, well, that's a good, a good tip. So what are you watching right now? What did you watch last week or this week? Well, because my wife, she wanted to watch things with music. So we're watching all the Busby Berkeley musicals. Uh -huh. uh, but the musical numbers are great. But of yeah. course, you have to sit through all these stories leading up to them, which is not so great. But the musical numbers are great. Mm. I saw Patrick Frick. Kennedy also asked, do you have a favorite musical of all that American art form that is also not? A favorite musical in the theater or in film? In, in theater, he asked, yeah. Uh, in theater, well, I can't think of any that I'm crazy about, no. Any, so, Kurt uh, Weill, I was always yeah. fond of Kurt Weill. For years, I was fascinated with uh, Mahagani. I mean, mm -hmm. I did the Three Penny Opera, of course. Mm -hmm. And there was somebody in France who said, okay, you can do Mahagani in my theater. And then I got sick and I couldn't do it. And he said, okay, Richard, Call me when you're better. I, I want to do it and I want you to do it. So I finally got better and I contacted him, but his theater uh, had lost its funding. And so I could mm -hmm. not do Mahagani. But that mm -hmm. was the piece I always loved. That would be my favorite musical, opera, what have you. Favorite opera, wonderful. Well, it's uh, something the world can uh, truly uh, lost and it would have been uh, fascinating. Um, yeah. Uh, coming close, uh, closer to our hour with on Howland, but um, since you are the most successful, as we pointed out, school of in, um, in the Americas of, of new work, of experimental work, which you did uh, without any formal curricula, without any uh, um, uh, semester breaks and papers and writing, you know, what do no, you say? An important yeah? thing, I would never offer a critique of the work that the people did. You never did? No. Because often I wouldn't like it very much, but I knew that that was me. And uh, people, you know, artists who are trying to do something, I don't think need a critique. They need encouragement. They need encouragement. 
this is really an important um, advice, you know, encouragement and not, not critique. Yeah, your, your ontological historical scene or perhaps only the Gießen School in Germany can be compared to the influence you had. So what would you say now? Um, I mean, I'm sure today what do I do? I artists something. are wishing, artists what are listening. What, what, what do you, what advice uh, do you have for um, you know this next generation of the people who would, let's say you would be still working there, the people who would be your interns, your light designers, your composers who would go on to great things. What do you think this time of Corona and this time of crisis that does existentially uh, ask questions? I mean, uh, we just had Amir who from, from, uh, from Palestine, uh, who, theater who said, you know, the Western world never had this insecurity, the uncertainty that we daily live with. Like people in Africa, we talk to say we live 400,000 people die of malaria. We have now 100,000, close to 100,000 deaths in, uh, in, in America, which is whatever, five times more than the Vietnam yeah. War. So, just, but still, what do you say to young artists who now engage uh, with the world? And well, it's, it's in difficult mind? in the theater because you have to get together with other people. And I don't know, if it's possible for you to find other people, uh, you know, two, three, five that you could work with. But then if you can find those people who, you know, pass the test and are not sick and are not contagious, if they can come to your apartment and you make something in your apartment and you have a uh, CD player that you can record a soundtrack, you can record music, and you just figure out what you can make in your apartment. That's all. The only way you do anything is by starting to do it. You know, uh, I never, you know, I wrote manifestos and things, but I assure you, I never looked at them when I was making theater. I never mm -hmm. thought about them when I was making theater. I proceeded purely by instinct, purely by instinct. When I wrote, it was writing little snatches of dialogue purely by instinct, not knowing what I was going to say. And then I would assemble them and I would design a set. I would design like 12 sets until I got one that I thought was sufficiently ambiguous, whether it was taking place in a cafe or a church or what was it. And we'd build a set and I'd make music in the soundtrack and we'd go into the theater. And on the first day, I'd say to the actors, Okay, uh, Joe, you say the first line and you come in the door and you go and you try to sit down, but then you get scared of the seat and you go against the wall. Oh, no, no, he did it. That's lousy. Let's instead, Joe, you come in, you say the line through the open door and then slam the door. And we would just keep trying other things that my instinct would lead me to try. Then when we were finished, I, who am pretty smart, uh, could see that unbeknownst to me, the play did have a secret coherence and did have a secret theme, but I never planned it, but I could see it. Most people who came to see the plays didn't see that, but I could see it. No, this is a significant advice to trust your instinct to, uh, to do something and you start by doing things when yes. you start doing something. And, just, uh, just have an impulse and do it and see where that leads. And do not be afraid. Do not be afraid to throw out a lot of stuff. You know, in my rehearsal, I used to tell the actors millions of times every day, I will say, oh no, that's stupid. I'm not referring to you. <laughs> I'm referring to my choices. That's stupid. Mm. Yeah. And going back to your image of the diamond, uh, you'll find a raw diamond, a stone. Not only that. You lose, you lose up to 60% of the stone to make yes. it shine. Yes. You have to cut away that yes. what makes it shine. Yes. And Ernest Hemingway said, the thing that a writer needs about, above all is a built-in shit detector. Because you turn out a lot of shit. <laughs> yeah. You have to be able to tell that and throw it out. Yeah, well, Richard, really, really thank you for, for taking your time and interrupting yep. your day and your work. And, you know, we all uh, admire you and uh, we, we miss you. Uh, well, it's been a pleasure. And uh, your work is significant um, and important and you continue doing this. I hope, uh, you know, that people will tune in and see your work on the uh, Vimeo. I think also, I think 
Lincoln's in the library of the performing arts has your videos and yes, all your yes. work even so as you said they are no, a lot of my a lot of the videos of my work is you find online but i hate it. online yeah. no i hate it shouldn't it distorts it. the work yeah. Yeah. And uh, we can take the Siegel Center uh, a pr a proud in the fact that we got Richard Foreman to join Zoom. Um, he is now yeah. on it, you know, if some of his colleagues, you know, can say, send him the Zoom invite uh, uh, for, for um, uh, interrupting him even more. And uh, yes. something is certain is, is that life will be interrupted and that our days will be interrupted. So really, thank you, Richard, uh, for listening. Thank uh, you all, our uh, listeners, for being uh, with us, this was, I think, an important uh, message from, from Richard, who, um, in a way, has always worked in a way as if there is a coronavirus out there. In a way, perhaps he was a vaccination that the body of American theater got to got stronger, and not that it changed the body, but it was something that uh, it helped it to, to, um, to, to become more strong. Like, yes, yeah, well, I'd like to think so. I'd like to think so. Yeah, and, um, and tomorrow we will have Thomas Oberender with us, the great... Uh, Curator also started out as a playwright of the Berlin Festspiele, right. um, who uh, runs the, the Martin Kropius Bar, where he has exhibitions uh, out. He runs uh, uh, the film Festspiele overlooks the Theater Treffen, the jazz uh, festivals, and um, and also his engagement you know, with the contemporary media's and. Uh, and uh, uh, he is a close observer of the scene in Europe and in the world, and uh, we. Really looking forward to hear from him what he detects. Yeah, that should be good. The changes that will be good. So I hope you will all be with us. Thanks to HowlRound uh, for for hosting us, Thea and DJ and Travis, our Siegel team, Andy and Sun Young. And Friday, Philip Howe will be uh, with us and with two other, uh, one or two other uh, partners, uh, Jordana from uh, the Jack Space. So. Um, Hopefully, uh, you will uh, again uh, give us some time to listen. I know how busy everybody is, how significant. Yeah, ba basically, is, so. uh, mm -hmm. if anybody has any comments about what we've been talking about, I wish mm -hmm. they would email me. Okay. At M M E D W A R D A, Madame Eduarda, which is the title of one of George Bataille's erotic novels, Madame Eduarda at earthlink.net. Wonderful. And we're just, good. That, that is good. And uh, and if not, send it to us to the Siegel Talks at gmail.com, the Siegel Talks, and um, we will forward it. So thank you again, Richard. And um, I hope to all see you all uh, again tomorrow and hear you from you and uh, stay safe and stay uh, tuned. Goodbye, okay. Richard. Bye -bye. Thank you.